So prolotherapy is a established um, technique where we inject a substance uh, which acts as a um, uh, it acts as a injection or a tool that allows us to uh, potentially augment or influence the way tissue is behaving. This is usually after degeneration or injury. Uh, uh, the best example is, for instance, ligaments. So ligaments around the knee. When one of the most difficult parts of our job sometimes is actually to work out exactly where a particular individual's pain is coming from, what we call the pain generator. Pain generators uh, can be from within the joint. They can be from uh, structures around the joint. They can be from the lining of the joint. Um, so for, for when you're targeting therapies, particularly regenerative medicine therapies or prototherapy, you've got to have a target. You, know, you, you, you can, if you have this uh, slightly scattergun approach that will hit everything, that becomes, um, well, maybe a little bit less scientific. There are some roles for that approach, but it's a little bit less scientific. Secondly, it can be expensive for the patient because you don't actually know where the problem is. So you start with treating one area and then it doesn't work and then you have to go on to step, step two and then that doesn't work and you go on to step three and that doesn't work. So the key for the patient is actually looking at their clinical history, the injury, uh, um, enhanced um, um, imaging like MRI scan, ultrasound, and almost most importantly is a clinical examination. When you've got your hands on the patient, you can usually um, establish where their primary cause of pain is. Obviously, maybe more than one, one area that's causing the pain. Uh, where prolotherapy comes in is that we tend to use it as something that, uh, as, as, a, as a product that we can inject into usually soft tissues. Uh, and what it will do is it will create an effect on that soft tissue where a, a loose or, or um, unstable ligament will tighten up. Uh, the commonest uh, substance we use is, is is widely available. It's called a, uh, it's just dextrose, so it's a, a sugar-rich uh, soup. And what we know is that when we inject that into uh, tissues, it creates a tightening effect. Okay, so it creates a, a fibrosis effect in the tissue, and that creates a tightening effect. Some people get pain from instability. Uh, they may also have arthritis, but it's instability that also causes pain. So when you're examining that patient and you take that, you, you do that detailed history, you can work out that actually they're getting both instability and they're getting arthritis pain um, and uh, uh, from mechanical loading. And again, when you examine them, you can verify that. Uh, and it gives you the ability to treat both uh, problems. So I don't usually use prototherapy inside of a joint because the dextrose isn't particularly good for cartilage, but you can use it to tighten up the structures or the laxity of the soft tissues around the joint, uh, while then injecting something that's uh, anti-inflammatory and uh, potentially has the ability to turn off the, the pain receptors, reduce the inflammation and allow some regeneration potentially within the joint. And that's where the two then cross over. So you can use prolotherapy in isolation. Sometimes if the only issue you have is laxity in a ligament or a joint, um, uh, but if you actually want to, if you've got degeneration and you want some improvement in that degeneration um, and some new uh, cells or uh, tissue uh, uh, regeneration to occur, then you bring in uh, the other modalities that will create new blood supply and new tissue. And that's where things like the blood plasma treatments, PRP, Enstride, um, Goldick, um, and, and then beyond that, the stem cell treatments, which uh, are now, I suppose, fairly widely available. Um, but uh, patients do need to understand that there's still a lot of work to be done to fully understand these uh, stem cell treatments. Regenerative medicine is a, is a relatively new field in medicine. And I think the, uh, the enthusiasts in this area who are doing the research and, and developing the translational work are learning all the time. And patients can share in that innovation journey. But I think certainly when I started doing regenerative medicine, we were uh, we thought, like I suppose many of us, that this would be uh, a, a relatively simple solution. We found actually the, the question and the answer is quite complicated. There are lots of different types of cells, different sources of cells. Um, and the way we use them is really, really important. Uh, how to work out what uh, is right for each individual is, is very challenging. Um, so it has to be a nuanced 
a decision uh, based on the individual requirements of a patient. Uh, and it's not always the right, right uh, the uh, uh, regenerative medicine or stem cell therapy is not the right answer for every patient. Uh, and I found actually that I use it less and less. Um, uh, and I start in a, in a different place uh, with often simpler treatments that, that uh, allow the patient uh, uh, a more rapid recovery uh, are less invasive and usually less expensive uh, because we are advancing in other areas like the plasma treatments probably more quickly than we are currently uh, in the stem cell side. Um, the, the knowledge gap in the translational side of stem cell therapy is still quite large. So stem cell therapy is a, it's quite a loaded word, actually. I mean, uh, stem cells... Um, evoke lots of different pictures in different people's heads. Uh, when I see patients in clinic, um, one of the first things I do is usually debunk all the myths or what they've read on Google, for instance. Uh, they'll see lots of pictures and YouTube videos of a cell that separates into uh, a targeted cell. So for instance, you, know, you can take a stem cell from fat or a stem cell from bone marrow. And on, on, I've seen plenty of videos on YouTube where people will show that the stem cells separate into a cartilage cell that cartilage cell um, then starts to make new cartilage. So patients often come in thinking they're going to get some miracle injection that's going to give them a new knee. Uh, so the first thing I usually start with is by explaining that that's actually not the case uh, in, in, in the laboratory. Uh, in our stem cell lab, we can make a cell change lineage. We can make a stem cell produce cartilage cells, even though it was a fat cell. Uh, but actually in vivo, in the, in the, in the um, living person, that actually rarely happens. It's not really been demonstrated to happen. Uh, so mesenchymal stem cells or stromal uh, stem cells that we use uh, 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 of adult uh, uh, stem cells tend to have a, a lineage. They tend to have a, uh, what that means is, you know, cart cartilage stem cells tend to generate cartilage in life uh, and fat stem cells tend to generate, you know, a, a similar type of tissue line and they're programmed in that way. They have, they have the ability of what we call plasticity, so they can change. And we know that, but like I said, in, 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 in um, where they're not manipulated and they're not expanded and we have not changed their control mechanisms, um, we, we, they generally actually behave as an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drug dispensing um, uh, cell. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, Arnold Kaplan, uh, coined the phrase of medicinal signaling cells quite a few years ago now. Um, and what we know is that if we drop stem cells into a joint, uh, we don't find those stem cells there three months later, six months later, rebuilding cartilage. What we actually find is that they drop the inflammation and the catabolic, so the high um, inflammation uh, area that creates an environment uh, of, uh, or a biological environment that deteriorates a joint and creates pain. Uh, so to me, stem cell therapy, adult, using adult um, mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs is predominantly an anti-inflammatory treatment. Um, and what that may allow the joint to do is that if it can get out of that high catabolic or high turnover inflamed environment, there is the potential for your body to, to create some regeneration. But that's certainly not something that we promise. Um, and uh, the, the jury's out uh, as to whether we can uh, create regeneration. We, it's been shown that it does occur, but I don't think you can say that reliably to a patient. Uh, and there aren't really any particularly good studies other than um, uh, one recent one around PRP by uh, Chu et al. Uh, from China, uh, which is a, a, a large study looking, and they actually did MRI scans on patients that, uh, at time intervals of year one and year five. So a five-year follow-up, which is really interesting because most studies finish at about one year follow-up. And they did show that there was some preservation of cartilage in the groups that were treated with orthobiologics. So, uh, but, but the, the, the data is fairly sparse. So I certainly don't say to patients, we will regenerate your joint. We tell them that we, re we will uh, uh, reduce the biological inflammation and that uh, uh, will relieve your pain uh, and it may allow some recovery in the joints or allow us to perhaps modify or mitigate some of the wear and tear that's going to happen uh, or would have happened anyway. Uh, so it may slow down wear and tear. Uh, 
but that's probably as far as I would go at this stage uh, with most of the treatments available to us. Uh, so stem cell therapy, um, again, uh, I've, I've mentioned this uh, slightly loaded word, but uh, the cells that we use um, have uh, the potential to um, improve blood supply, uh, improve and uh, more natural healing. And by that, I mean that there are plenty of studies, both preclinical and clinical, demonstrating on biopsy, uh, biopsies where you take a sample of tissue uh, after you've uh, treated an area. And what they've shown is that, for instance, a tendon uh, that's been injected uh, with, um, uh, for instance, stem cell therapies or orthobiologics, uh, tends to generate more natural tendon cells, what we call tenocytes. So it's more rich in normal tenocytes rather than generating usually by scarring. Uh, so tendons uh, and most injured areas like muscles uh, tend to heal by scarring once they've been injured because they tear that tear heals by scarring and, and, and you have quite a lot of scar tissue. That can then create some of the cycle of where that scar tissue is weaker, uh, uh, is often weaker and it's not your natural um, uh, repair tissue. So you're not getting like for like, it's not tendon for tendon. You can then increase that um, uh, tendon for tendon replacement or muscle to muscle replacement ratios, uh, potentially by using all the biologics, which will modify the healing signals within the tissue in that area to generate more uh, actual uh, normal tissue rather than scar tissue. The stem cell therapies uh, in orthopedics are growing um, a, a huge amount. We were the first, um, I was involved with the first group that brought that to the UK probably in 2015, 2016. Um, and uh, we, we um, wanted to bring it out of the lab uh, where I was doing research on it uh, into pa patient use um, uh, because it showed significant promise. And we also needed to have that translational element. So uh, in those early days, I was saying to patients very clearly that yeah, they'd be sharing on that innovation journey with us. We knew it was safe. And that was the first, first element. There'd been plenty of studies in Japan, the US, uh, Italy, Spain, showing that it was a safe treatment. What we didn't know was whether it was efficacious, whether it was effective and worked um, uh, long term. So uh, I think uh, if you were quite selective with your patients and the patients understood that and still wanted to go ahead, uh, then we were willing to treat them. We, we collected data on all of those patients. We've got two, three year data uh, and beyond on some of those patients. Uh, some of it's been published. Um, and uh, we've shown that uh, it can be effective in, in, in some patients up to that period of time and beyond. Uh, but there are people it doesn't work for. So yeah, there's a lot to learn yet. And I think there is a non-responder group. There's a non-responder group. And, and to me, the real goal in, in our research is to find out who the non-responders are and why they are non-responders. Uh, and that may be genomics, it may be metabolic, it may be that we're not getting the dose right, we're not putting enough in in each individual patient. There are different what we call patient phenotypes. By that I mean, you know, some people have arthritis uh, and it can be quite advanced and severe, but they actually have very little inflammation, very little swelling and often very little pain. And there's another patient that can often have quite well, mild arthritis, but have lots of swelling, lots of pain, lots of heat. Um, and so their body is reacting very differently, the same pathology. And uh, we've just had the biggest exercise on what we call immune, uh, immune responses uh, around the world with the COVID pandemic. We've seen that one person can get COVID and take two paracetamol and feels fine the next day. And their next door neighbor can get COVID and end up on intensive care fighting for their life. Um, it's the same, same disease to some extent, but their body reacts very, very differently. And uh, so uh, I think uh, stem cells are, uh, are very interesting, but they are still relatively experimental. Uh, they are really the future of this space. I think all the biologists will take over uh, early and preventative uh, therapies. Our current problem is actually that we probably see patients too late. They tend to get referred to us at a late stage or they come to us after they've already seen surgeons whose focus is replacement rather than preservation of a joint. Um, and, you know, I, I have a real focus on joint preservation as much as possible. Um, I, I treat lots of younger patients, probably where, where my focus is in trauma. So I have a lot of polytrauma patients who 
uh, you know, cause themselves uh, uh, or, or had caused to them injuries that affect them in their 20s and 30s. So they're not the kind of population that I usually say, well, I'll, you know, um, I'll put in a hip replacement or a knee replacement because we know it doesn't work very well in that population group. And it doesn't last very long. And it puts them in a position where they're going to require multiple further operations for their life, uh, each one with diminishing returns. So um, uh, it's not widely used uh, yet, because I think, one, it's poorly understood. Secondly, um, uh, it's not that easy to learn uh, a, a lot about. Uh, I founded the Academy of Regenerative Medicine in the UK because I found there's a huge knowledge gap. Uh, so we've created that academy. We, we now train, we run about five or six courses a year, and we get around 20 delegates on those courses. So if you, you know, there's thousands of surgeons out there, but actually only about 100 a year coming to our courses uh, and actually learning the, uh, the nuances of the evidence, the cell therapy side. And currently in the UK, there's no board exams or uh, regulatory authority around this space for, for teaching or uh, knowledge, unlike America, which has a, an academy and board of regenerative medicine, but it's something that we're working on and we're hoping to create in the UK to allow some standard of education. Uh, and regenerative medicine is still not a specialty in the UK, unlike, for instance, just across the English Channel is France. And France actually has regenerative medicine as a specialty training program. Uh, so I think we're probably a little bit behind. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the NHS is, is, is a national health service in the UK, is something I love. Uh, but actually, it can actually be um, uh, a two-edged sword. It can be a uh, uh, it can be a block to innovation, uh, as much as it is um, a place to innovate and to uh, improve patient outcomes.